Dear God in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath day and for the rest and for the blessing. And I thank you that we can all come together and be benefited by this afternoon's Vespers. I pray um, that your Holy Spirit will be here to help us to grasp the importance of what Elder Tess, Tess is teaching us. Mm. Help us to not miss the key points. Um, help us to um, be able to take it away and meditate on it and, um, and allow it to change us, change our minds, change our behaviours, um, change the way we think. And in your mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Marie. That was an encouraging start. We've lost our board work from last night, um, which isn't a negative. It's because of the fellowships held this morning. I just, I was just um, saying something on the New York Times that I thought was interesting to mention. We know the election is today. And it validated, I think, what we were seeing. They make this point about the Australian election and they say that the coalition in many ways is being pulled to the right wing on a number of issues. And there is an increased effort by Labor to move to the centre to try to pick up some of those moderate Liberal voters. Um, that's Natasha Kassam, Director of the Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program at the Lowry Institute. So it's just interesting to hear it said so explicitly what I think we've kind of seen and said that there's this, um, that the Conservative Party, the, the, the Liberals are, are moving even more right wing. I, I suppose the coalition has something to do with that. But then that Labor in trying to pick up the centrist voters they've left behind, and they make the point that this is really strategic. And some of them say how, how clever this is, that it's really clever because they're trying to pick up the centrist voters that the Liberal Party in moving more and more right wing is left behind. I do think it's left us a little, um, it's left that left wing portion uh, a little bit more empty, at least when it comes to the two, two most major parties. Um, just interesting to hear that said, small comment on the election. I asked last night, why, why are we studying the, the Trinity? And I, I think all of the answers were good ones. I didn't see anything that I would disagree with. They were all reasonable. They were all, I think, defendable. But I believe the most important reason that we're doing this is not to see what is in existence outside but what is in existence inside the movement. And to try and demonstrate how that happens, I talked about straw man arguments, waiting for someone to write to me and say straw person. So I, I'm not sure. But the, that kind of straw person image that we can create, and it's very tempting because that is what, especially since the, the beginning of cable news has been popular on both sides, um, although the left wing is often accurate, for example, on abortion, they're always seen as creating this straw man argument where the right wing is trying to, um, you know, abolish Roe versus Wade and the right wing would say, no, we're not. We're just nice little Supreme Court justices. We know what precedent means. Um, and often the left wing was quite accurate in how they portrayed and, and the evidences of that are becoming more and more apparent, but it is still something that both can engage in. And this isn't something new that's being said in these classes. We went right back to our libertarianism when we discussed the freedom truckers. So it's all too easy, and we made this point, it's all too easy for the media to go down to those protests and see the neo-Nazis and find a swastika. That's, 
that's kind of what happened. News now is built upon ratings that they need engagement. It's not just there to share news. It's now increasingly become a form of entertainment. Um, the written media is a lot safer um, th than what people find on, on cable. CNN is kind of a headline, but I would probably not watch CNN. I'd go to a written source. Um, but it is based on viewership and um, engagement. So if they're going to go and speak to their base and they're going to go and see the freedom truckers in Canada, they're going to take those cameras and show their base something sensational. And it is there that the far right is there. They'll find a swastika, they'll find the neo-Nazis, they'll find the white supremacists. But when they do that, the problem is, is they miss all these people when they find the neo-Nazis, they miss Pop who's been trucking for 30, 40 years and is concerned about the erosions of his freedom, who's there with his grandkids, who doesn't want violence. And that is a much larger portion of that group than the neo-Nazis. But when it's all put into this, I feel like I should swap this around as more reflective of right wing and left wing, so I don't confuse. When we put it all over here, then it's all, it's all too easy to say, and not just for people in this movement, it's all too easy for those who consider them Democrat or progressive in the United States to say, look how good we are, because we don't like swastikas. We don't like neo-Nazis, we don't like white supremacy, aren't we great? It's too easy to do that. We needed to go in and see the argument about freedom. And I wanted to sell it. I wanted to make it look beautiful, small government, um, education, individual philanthropists, doing that work of, of educating, um, raising money, to, to support schools and, and mental health institutions and churches taking care of the poor and the needy. That's their purpose. So it's, it's built around such a beautiful argument. I wanted to see us, us to see the beauty of the argument so that we could identify the libertarianism in ourselves and then have us see the reality of that when it comes head to head with equality and what that is how that is playing out prophetically in the United States over civil rights. And then if we don't get what's happening in the last 30 years, take it back to the civil rights movement and say, you like that picture? We need to start dismantling the Civil Rights Amendment, um, Civil Rights Act. We didn't quite get into the far right, the militia groups, Gavin McKinney's, the Proud Boys, but that's where you also see all of it. And it's when it's sold to young men, predominantly young men, it is sold as a beautiful package. And that is what is so dangerous. And that is what has been pervasive throughout this movement. And some people, a, a vast minority, but some people have written to me since those presentations and said, I get it now. I was thinking that way. I thought freedom was beautiful. That's why I was doing these things or wearing these things or acting this way. And now I can see it. And that has been encouraging. I just wish it was not a minority. Um, so we can't just go to the freedom protests and see the swastikas. There is a reason there are swastikas there. <laughs> because if you're going to pursue, th there's a, demographic in which you feel comfortable and there is a demographic in which you don't feel comfortable and there is a reason that far-right groups feel comfortable in that kind of environment. I don't know if how many people have a Netflix account um, or know someone who does but there is even if you were to I guess to spend a little I don't like to promote things that cost, but I do think it is worthwhile to just 
get one if you don't have one or try and get in contact with someone that has one and watch the two-part Netflix documentary series on Jimmy Savile. Does everyone know who Jimmy Savile is? Does anyone not know who Jimmy Savile is? If you don't, then I'll... So Molly, do you, do you, do you know who he is? No. No? No. No. So a few people don't know who Jimmy Savile is. Um, this is a very painful documentary. Does anyone know who he is who would like to explain who he is? If not, I'll just open up Wikipedia and do my best. Catherine. Um, he was a man, a philanthropist that, he, and a fundraiser for some health institutions in the you know, Kingdom, in, in England, I think. Um, and then he was exposed not all that long ago for having abused girls in those institutions. Yeah. Yes. He was a cultural icon for about half a century, 50 years, one of the most famous figures in the UK from about 1950 through to the early 2000s. He died in 2011. An English DJ, television and radio personality on the BBC um, hosted a number of shows, including shows targeting children. Um, Jim will fix it. He'd take requests from children who wanted him to fix something and then he'd meet these children and he'd fix things. He was a huge philanthropist, um, probably the wrong word, but he raised an estimated 40 million pounds for charities during his lifetime, was widely praised for his personal qualities and as a fundraiser. The problem was, was that for over 50 years, um, he was sexually abusing mostly underage, underage women. I can't express how awful uh, that documentary is to watch, but it is so educational on how society and culture treats um, these personalities. But the reason I mention him in this context is because he, he has an, had an order of the British Empire And the, one of the reasons he got, and he was knighted, it's Sir James Wilson Vincent Savile. One of the reasons, especially that he was knighted, was that Margaret Thatcher petitioned the Queen over and over again. Ma Margaret Thatcher loved Jimmy Savile. In fact, the whole royal family loved Jimmy Savile. When there was national emergencies, a disaster, a plane crash, um, Prince Charles actually wrote to Jimmy Savile and said, you're really good with the public. You tell us, you tell the royal family how we can respond to the public, what we need to say, how we need to, um, how we need to present ourselves before the public. And he sent the royal family and it was given to the Queen to read, advising the royal family on how to handle themselves in public view. He was the favourite of Margaret Thatcher. He was also very popular with Princess Diana. She just used to go visit him to hang out. He was incredibly popular, but his misogyny and sexual abuse of underage women was not, it's not very hidden. And the reason I just mentioned him now was because of his popularity with Margaret Thatcher. The reason Margaret Thatcher loved him was that she was a right wing conservative libertarian. And with that mindset, the government needs to be small. The government doesn't raise money to keep key institutions funded. Instead, you have people raise this money and he represented to Margaret Thatcher what libertarianism was capable of. When you had just an ordinary citizen go out to the public and say, look, this institution that houses 
um, vulnerable young women needs funding? And will the public please donate to fund this institution? And people love him and people donate. Government is entirely out of it. That's the beautiful libertarian view. It's, it's these philanthropists, it's these activists that are completely separate to, to control of big government, appealing to the good hearted members of society um, to help fix and educate their society and support these institutions. But because the government was not involved, he was then able to turn up in his car and take those vulnerable young women and do whatever he wanted with whoever he wanted, how whoever he wanted. And those women, hundreds and hundreds of them, because they were vulnerable, because he was famous and loved by society, he was untouchable until after he died. He had put on his tombstone after he died, it was good while it lasted. And that was seen as so offensive to the people that he had abused, that when the full scale of his abuse came to light, they took his tombstone under cover of darkness, tore it up, took it down to a shed. This is like police officers, people who were angry and it was too late for justice because he was too popular, because government was not involved, because you don't take down a great man just because of a few troublesome young women. And they spent all night hammering and chiseling that phrase off of his tombstone, kind of like there is no, kind of like Hitler's bunker is a parking lot today, so no one could ever admire it again. That was the extent of his fall after he died. He lay in state for a number of days at his, after his death. Uh, I want to, I think there's a few things we can learn from that, but that's the danger of the beautiful trust that libertarianism wishes to have with society and how it empowers individuals without big government oversight. That is the reality of Margaret Thatcher's vision and it is horrific and it's worth watching the documentary just to get that point. So we tried to show how there are these extremes. Uh, it's easy to see and create the straw man over here and say, they're all neo-Nazis or they're all Roy Den Hollander. And that's not the reality. Um, the vast majority are, are in here. And when we see this and make ourselves feel good, we feel comfortable sitting in here. We don't realize that's where most of the right wing is. And I hoped that that point had come through when we discussed libertarianism. It sells itself as progressive and beautiful. The reality of it, whether you want to look at Jimmy Savile, the Civil Rights Act, January 6th, the reality is always awful. And that is the type of way Satan messages. It, it, it sounds wonderful. But it, there's been a lot of talk this last week about the white supremacist terrorist. He's here. But I just wanted to mention Tucker Carlson and his popularity. In October, 2018, Tucker Carlson Tonight was the second highest rated news show in all of prime time after Hannity with 3.2 million nightly viewers. By April 2020, Carlson's program surpassed Hannity as the highest rated prime time cable news show with an average audience of 4.56 million viewers. During the second quarter of 2020, Tucker Carlson Tonight garnered an average audience of 4.33 million viewers the largest for any program in the history of cable news. In July 2020, Tucker Carlson Tonight broke the record for highest rated program in US cable news history, garnering an average nightly audience of 4.33 million viewers. In February 2022, Mediaites reported that in the month of October, Tucker Carlson was the number one watched host among Democrats 
in the key 25 to 54 age demographic across all networks. So that is 4.33 million people, minus a few, who don't intend to engage in white supremacist terrorism. That is 4.33 million people who do not consider themselves racist. And you have the left wing connecting Tucker Carlson to a white supremacist terrorist. And 4.33 million people in the United States would disagree with that because they see Tucker Carlson as logical and reasonable. He says he's not racist. It's in here. And there's 4.33 million people in here. More people who say they are Democrats aged between 25 and 54 more in that age range of Democrats watch Tucker Carlson than watch Rachel Maddow. That's the scale of the problem and it's kind of frightening when we see it that way. So if we, if we take the message and we cut it down and we twist it slightly and then we add to that what is left a little of our own dropperful of justification what we do is we essentially just it's like processed food we process the message through our own little factory and what it does is it puts all the bad people over here and it puts us as left-wing progressives it's not that simple externally it's not that simple internally and we're going into men's rights arguments and libertarianism to, to try and prove that point i agreed with everything that everyone said and put up yesterday um, we discussed then how do we vote and I wanted to make the point, it, it can't be th through what we say we are. We have to, when it comes to someone like Tucker Carlson, we have to listen to what they say. Because if we put 4.33 million Americans here and they say that we're not, they are not, they're going to start saying, well, the left wing does um, just put out fake news because I know I'm not a white supremacist terrorist. So they start, they start seeing the left wing as creating that straw man argument. And I think it damages the cause. Tucker Carlson doesn't come out looking better by understanding the complexity of what he's saying, the rationality and reasonableness seemingly of what he's saying. He doesn't, I don't believe that he comes out looking better but we come out with a much clearer view of the dangers of some of our own thinking, especially when it comes to gender. So listen to what they say, and two, don't listen to what they say. Because when an evangelical pastor says, I am not a member of QAnon, but these pedophile cults in Congress, the, these pedophiles like Hillary Clinton and key members of Hollywood. Someone doesn't need to say they are a member of a QAnon group. It's not really a formalized group that way. Men's rights activists and the men's rights movement, I think that's a misleading term. It's not such a coalesced movement. It's not necessarily all activists all we have to do is support their ideology if a pastor stands up and starts talking ab ab about hillary clinton being in a pedophile ring then i don't care whether or not he he is or isn't part of an organized qanon movement he is part of that ideology and i wanted to make that point also when it comes to to the men's rights arguments it's about the ideology that we believe in and we promote. That is how we vote. 
And I also want to, want to be clear, Brandon, you put up what we say. And what we say does matter. And Elder Paminder and I discussed that afterwards. And he got your point. And I think you have a point. Sometimes what we say is the only thing we've got. And our voice is important. Um, the point I was trying to make, though, is it can be very misleading. Um, it's ultimately not our words that determine which way we vote in this political election that we term the great controversy. So why, why all this sexism in the world? We've been going into the misogyny behind, and I just wanted to read that actually. Um, we went into the sexism that pervades from, from the book, The Gendered Brain. Just a little paragraph she, she thought to put at the beginning by Stephen Gold. Few tragedies can be more extensive than the stunting of life. Few injustices deeper than the denial of an opportunity to strive or even to hope by a limit imposed from without, but falsely identified as lying within. The way she's using that thought in the context of this book is she talks about the tragedy of the stunting of life and how extensive this occurs when it comes to gender. The injustice, the gendered injustice, when women lose the opportunity to strive or even to hope, not by something that lies within, not by biology, but by a limit imposed by society and culture that she says it's falsely identified as biology, a biological limit. And it's that concept of the biology that she's fighting. And we tried to show how that this is not the, the standard thought of the scientific community. This is not the standard thought of atheism and has never been. So I want to ask if we can see that, if we can see this, that when it comes to the Sunday law, which, which is misogyny and the, um, the attack on women's and LGBT rights through um, the branches of US government, also worldwide, when we see that and, and the escalation towards that, and we say it's not Protestantism, it's not the whole Protestantism, and it's not the cause, we wanted to say what is the cause? What then is the cause of, of this misogyny, this development towards the, the Sunday law, if it isn't church and state? Does anyone have any thoughts they wanted to share or perspectives before I continue? Not at this stage. So I'll ask a question. What's the purpose of the midnight cry? Ray, what's the purpose of the midnight cry? Um, well, it's the light that guides us all the way to the second advent. Um, that's a nice textbook answer. Um, I guess the, the purpose of light is to, to show us the way um, by showing us obstacles that might be in our path, um, showing us where not to tread as much as where to tread.
sometimes the textbook is the most poetic. Um, but I think you said that in a lovely way. Um, if I can. Just want to draw up what this movement is, has been since 1989. 1989, we'll skip to the midnight cry. Remember, they don't understand the nature of the kingdom until you get into this history. 14, 16, 18, You lose sight of this on the line of 144,000, but like you said, Ray, this is the light that doesn't stop shining. So it's not restricted to that. It's going to go all the way, and I don't want to cut the line for this. It's going to go all the way through to the Sunday law, close of probation, second advent. But I want to take this history especially. So I'm going to take that and expand it some more. And we'll just take 2018. Twenty nineteen. Twenty twenty. 2021. Getting tied up with dates. Brody, you had your hand up. To answering the question about the purpose of the midnight cry, I was going to say uh, to wake us up. Yes, because what's coming? Second Advent. Oh God. The wedding. And before the wedding, the door is shut. And before the door is shut. What I want us to see is what it's warning us of is of the Sunday law. We know there, there's a wedding down here and there's a shut door and it's a complicated parable depending on the lesson people want to draw. I don't think that, I think there's a couple of applications in there. I'll leave that one to Elder Paminda. But they need to awaken because the Sunday law is imminent now and they have to understand it. So the midnight cry is, is kind of going to give them a, the sleeping virgins a little bit of a kick and so can't you see it? It's here. You need to be ready for this. And if I can combine some parables, maybe I'm not allowed to do that. You don't understand what it looks like. Open your eyes, see what it looks like. Um, can someone give me the dates for this? Twenty eighteen. Uh, that was. November 9, then we had May 2020, which was externally George Floyd, internally uh, Apis Bull, 2021. I've just got tongue tied here. Catherine, you have a good memory. Um, in 2021, we had the formalization on wedding of Cana, and I think that was in August. Um, August. 2021. And then in 2021, we had radical feminism. And I think that was in October. Um, I don't think I know anything beyond that one. When did we do, when did we do LGBT? That was, was August, it? 2021, yep. So we understood gay marriage, uh, radical feminism, yep. apis bull. Okay. 
So the virgins need to be awoken because the Sunday law is, is, is coming and it's coming with a test, a test for them. The midnight cry is given in Arkansas in, 20, in 2018. The first angel is there, doesn't understand the nature of the kingdom and he's not going to like it. But I have so much respect for him. I do believe that he had insight that was not human. And I think we can learn a lot from his response. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to someone who I do think suffered more for the development of this message than we realize. And um, I, I still feel the need to show him utmost respect for what he has done. But his response, when he heard the message, wake up the Sunday law is coming, what did he say? Marie, did I miss you? I put my hand up um, for the question you asked before about why did we have a midnight cry? So I'm not sure if you want to go back. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that it was to take us out of our um, conservative Adventist mindset and to put us into a, a liberal way of thinking. Um, and that's very broad to say that, um, to prepare us for the Sunday law. Yes. So it's going to take Elder Jeff and it's going to wrench him from something. And how does he respond to that when he's wrenched from something? Raymond. Um, didn't he say like after two streams of information was taught, like why did she have to teach that? Yes, it was offensive. Offensive and painful because he felt he was being attacked. Josephine. I, I may be thinking wrongly because I was thinking about when when it was said that it's the Sunday law, how did he respond? And I thought he thought it was fanaticism, but I could be wrong. He loved everything except for two streams of information. He loved everything except what I said about Fox News and right-wing politics in America. Everything else, raffia, panium, general concept of information war as it relates to the King of the North, the King of the South, November 9, World War II, he loved all of that. Pyrrhus, when Ray said, he said, why did you have to teach that? He didn't mean the whole of the message. He said, I love this message. Why did you have to go and ruin it by teaching two streams of information and attacking right-wing American politics? What's wrong with that? That's what I want us to see. Catherine. Um, are you asking specifically, like, on the day, uh, you know, because uh, I'm thinking about how he said he wanted to go back to Laodicea, but I'm not sure if you wanted to go that far ahead in time. I wasn't because he has a full year to develop that argument. This yeah. was his initial reaction to feeling attacked because I think it is in that initial reaction, that initial defensive posture, that he hit the nail on the head of what he felt he was being attacked over. Ah, uh, did he? I, don't, I wasn't there, but did he say something about it's, the next thing they're going to do is like say gay marriage is okay? He doesn't really say that till 2019. Okay. Uh that <laughs> all comes later. That wasn't his original concern. We weren't even teaching gender equality in 2018 explicitly. It's built into attacking right-wing politics, which I'm sure was all the subject of gender had to have been on his mind as we're attacking right, the right-wing position. 
but that wasn't his underlying issue. Graham. Um, I was there and there was lots of different things that were said. So I'm not entirely sure if it's precisely the one that you're talking about. But if I was to merge a couple together from that time period, it would be uh, that a, a weaker vessel who is a European socialist is telling me, an American, about my politics and how I receive my information here in the US. Yes, that is precisely the point I wanted us to see. His first gut defensive position was that he was being attacked. And where in that do you see, he's not saying you, Tess, are attacking Protestantism, you're attacking Adventism, you're attacking Ellen White. That's not his problem in 2018. All those arguments develop later. His initial problem was not anything that we said about Christianity, Protestantism, Adventism, the Bible, how to read. He didn't care about any of that in 2018. Raymond. Oh, I thought it might've been um, that uh, the Nathanims and the Levites were being ploughed by sources outside the movement um, as flowing from that two streams. What happens is because he makes that argument that he's under attack, not his Christianity, but something else, then in the late months, December 2018, we come back in and use the line of the Nathanims to try and show him that it has to be this way, that there has to be two streams of information externally. That kind of comes later to try and help him see the, it's, it's an irrefutable point if you follow the reform lines. So yes, that's important, but it kind of comes later, that particular defense of two streams. Brendan. So he felt attacked because, um, this is more of a question, is did he feel attacked because it identified what his political ideology was, was actually on the wrong side? Is that, so everything would have been fine if you didn't say that. Is that basically the where he's at? So he felt victimised by the left coming in. How, how is it possible that this left wing is the correct stream? Is that something he couldn't compute in his mind? Yes, I think so. It's just that there's... When he hears two streams of information, which is the midnight cry, and he digests that, he is upset that Wednesday night where prayer meeting is cancelled and we all stand in one room and I try and bury myself in a corner. It's, he is upset, but not once was it about how we read the Bible or what we were doing with Ellen White quotes, or that we were attacking. He spent, by that, by that period, he spent 20, 30 years attacking Adventism. Doesn't care if we attack Adventism. He spent 20, 30 years going to Ellen White quotes to make points. We weren't attacking him on the level of, of his religion. If we did, he would have come back with a religious argument. He does do that, but it's months, a year later, that he's able to scramble together religious arguments to fight this. But that was not what this fight was ever really about. Josephine. 
I'm guessing, but I think was this was it his political stand with he was closer to the right side rather than uh, the left, and that means he's going to have to change. That's a guess. Yes, to a degree. Yes, to a degree. Um, I just don't want to give out what I think until I get through people's questions. So I'm sorry if it's not a very good answer yet. I'll come back to it. Um, but it might not help just to blurt out what I think if people still have points to make. Marie. It seems from what um, Graham said that the fact that you were a female and that the message was coming from outside of the United States of America, this seemed to be more of a um, issue than anything else. I'm sure there. I'm sure there was more to it than that, but definitely they must have been very big um, issues in his mind for for him to actually spell that out. I think it added to the feeling of being bruised, for sure. Brandon? In, in what Graham said, um, you know, Euro European socialists or coming in, intervening in telling, it's, it seems nationalistic as well. Um, I don't know, you've got, you've got external people coming in yeah, telling, telling me what is right and wrong. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just trying to get my head around it. Um, Josephine. Mm. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to say might sound offensive, but I'll say it because I don't mean it that way. I just want to say what I think. Do you think it's because um, he feels that this whole thing is being wrenched from his hand. Um, the message is going to a different messenger that he wasn't aware of. He was, he loved this, he loved that, he loved this other thing, but he wasn't aware of certain things. He didn't understand it. And could God be giving it to someone else to carry it on? from there and he feels hurt this isn't kind of getting to the to the point of that i wanted to make but just going off what you said he saw the midnight cry he cut off the bit about two streams of information and gathered what was left he twisted what was left to what he more suited his beliefs. And then he started his own, including concepts as such as predicting all kinds of events at Panium, um, all kinds of things. He went through this exact process between the giving of the midnight cry and when he finally left. Um, so there is, I think, in that process, the feeling that this message is no longer, it no longer suits him but why does it no longer suit him? What did it attack that he felt he had to do this? Sharon, you don't have to answer that precisely, but. Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, how relevant it is, um, <laughs> but it's more of a question, I guess. Um, I've only really heard bits and pieces as to his response. Um, but was it that he could see um, through the two streams of information the issues um, that would come, that he would have to address, as in like feminism, LGBT? Um, I know it was very early, early on. Um, 
that was just, um, I don't know if it was a question or a point. <laughs> Works either way. I do believe that the increase of knowledge of the Sunday law in 2019 is feminism, gender equality. The formalization of understanding the Sunday law is 2021, radical feminism, radical gender equality. And both of them, both of them are left-wing concepts. They are not right-wing, they are not conservative, they are absolutely not libertarian. Both of them are left-wing concepts. And so I'm sure that everything that comes packaged with the left wing, whether it was on his, in his conscious, conscience or, or subconscious, conscious or subconscious, that that was part of what he was hearing. Um, I'm going to take, so, so I, I do think your point is valid. I'm going to take Molly and then Lynn, and then I will, I will wrap up this discussion part. Molly. <laughs> Um, I think from the from the response that he came, especially what Graham was saying, is that he feel uh, weakened when the midnight cry came with the two stream of information. He realized that he was exposed to him being a nationalist and, and, and sexist, and then he knew by the two stream of information that the movement would be split. And he was, that's why he responded so defensively. And, and I don't know, but I mean, that's what I'm gathering. No other part of the message attacked him. That's why he was not defensive to any other part of the message. The point I want to us to bring us to is precisely what was attacked because what was attacked was not his Adventism. Then. Yeah, um, I was going to say some of his um, traditional Adventist views. However, uh, I was also going to say that he had a very literal to literal uh, perspective of prophecy from what I observed and we all did I mean not just him um, and he really had a very patriarchal view and I think that there even though he voiced the political perspective that challenged him the two streams of information I think that really highlighted and that's why it was seen to mention things like, you know, the weaker vessel and that sort of thing, because how it kind of would have been really hard to compute how that would fit into his biblical patriarchal perspective of a worldview, really. And that couldn't sit with the democratic well, he couldn't sit with a democratic view because it had to sit with a, um, with the, uh, it's gone out of my head, the opposite to the democratic. Um, the, uh, yeah, Republican went out of my head. Uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of, it just really didn't compute in his patriarchal view of his world, patriarchal worldview and, and his religious worldview, political, religious, anything would have been very challenging. That was my thought. At this stage with two streams of information, we're not going into two streams within Adventism. We haven't done that. We haven't done two streams within Protestantism. We don't do two streams within Catholicism until late 2019, over a year later. All we've done is go into the United States itself, look at Donald Trump, look at Fox News versus CNN, look at Tucker Carlson versus Rachel Maddow, for example, and say that these two sides that are fighting in the United States is part of the fight over the Sunday law and that Fox News and that stream and 
everything, including Trump, that it's connected to is the stream that is wrong and the stream that will bring about the Sunday law. So we haven't gone into attacking his Adventism, his religion. What I believe Elder Jeff was saying was not you're attacking my religious beliefs, not, attack, not that you're attacking the Bible or the reading of Ellen White, not that you're attacking Adventism or Protestantism. What he said was you are attacking my culture. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it would have mattered if I was Australian and a woman or a Californian man who watches Rachel Maddow and his left wing and male. I don't think it would have made him accept the message anymore if I was from some liberal from California or some socialist, apparently. Um, I didn't vote for the socialist party primarily, by the way, so I'm, I, I mustn't be a socialist. Don't know why that came to mind, but it's not a, I don't think that was the core issue. What he said was you're attacking my culture and it's culture that I want to say is the cause. It's not Protestantism. It's not religion, it's culture. And we need to understand the difference between the two.